Hi, Jeff Lucklin here with the Nurture Nature Center, and this is Science at Home. In previous videos, we've talked about the sun, the planets of the solar system, comets and asteroids, but I've talked very little about the Earth's moon. And we're going to correct that today, because our moon is actually really fascinating. And it's usually the first thing that captures people's attention when they start exploring the night sky with a telescope. You don't need a telescope to observe the moon. Going out on a clear night and just looking at the moon with your unaided eye, you can see light and dark patches covering its surface. The lighter regions are the lunar highlands, and they're composed primarily of a very fine uh, powdery material called regolith that's more reflective than the darker regions. The darker areas are called the lunar seas, although they contain no liquid water. Um, and they are dark because they are primarily composed of a darker basaltic rock, which is actually quite similar to what we find on Earth near volcanically active regions. Another feature that we can see on the moon without magnification are the various transformations that occur as the moon goes through its phases. Uh, the moon orbits the Earth, and as it does this, the amount of sunlight that hits the part of the moon that always faces the Earth changes. To better understand this, let's look at it from another perspective. Uh, I have here a very bright light, which is going to represent the sun. And my position, where I stand, represents uh, the Earth. And to represent the moon, I've got a model of a moon that I'm going to hold on a stick. So I'm now holding the moon out at arm's length, and I have the camera right near my face, so you can see exactly what I see. And uh, you probably don't see very much, uh, because the side of the moon that's facing me, that's facing the camera, is in shadow, it's in darkness, because our source of light is in front of me. Uh, so this would be the equivalent of a new moon. Uh, we can't really see a new moon very well because the side of the moon facing the Earth is in shadow at that point. But as the moon orbits around the Earth, as we move, we eventually begin to see a sliver of light, begin to grow on the moon. And when we get to this position where about a quarter of the moon is eliminated, we have a quarter moon. This is a waxing moon because the amount of light is increasing. So eventually we see a half moon, a waxing half moon, and then we see three quarters of the moon full, and eventually we see a full moon. So now the side of the moon that is facing me, that is facing the camera, or the equivalent of the side of the moon facing the Earth, is fully illuminated because the sun is to my back. But this doesn't last for very long because the moon continues in its orbit, and eventually the amount of light begins to drop off. This is a waning moon. So now three quarters of the moon is illuminated, but this is decreasing. And now we have a waning half moon as I move into this position. And then as I continue in my orbit, we eventually have a waning crescent again. Uh, and if I continue on a little bit more, we're back where we started at a new moon. And these changes occur regularly, cyclically. It takes the, noon, uh, the moon 29 and a half days to complete one orbit around the Earth and go through this series of changes, to go through its phases. Don't forget that I was rotating at an angle so that I was moving low as I passed by the sun and then I'm moving upwards towards the ceiling as I face away from the sun. The reason I did that is so that the moon didn't fall into the shadow cast by my head or so that the moon didn't block my view of the, the source of light. But every now and again, as the moon, as the actual moon orbits around the Earth, it does fall into the Earth's shadow. And we call that a lunar eclipse. And I'm going to do that now. I'm just going to rotate at just the right angle so that the moon passes into the shadow cast by my head. That would be a lunar eclipse. Uh, and equivalently, uh, the moon can pass directly in front of the sun, and that would be a solar eclipse. Now, just to be clear, um, the parts of the Earth where you actually see the moon completely block the sun are very, very small uh, during a real solar eclipse. The shadow of the moon uh, is actually very tiny on the Earth, so only the area under that black dot would see a total solar eclipse. So this shadow is really tiny, partly because of how small the moon is relative to the size of the Earth, and partly because of how far away the moon is from the Earth. Uh, it's hard to show people the true scale of the Earth-Moon system, uh, but I can do it, you know, with uh, a little help from another model. So here I have uh, a model of the Earth, 
And if the Earth was this size, which is about the size of a standard classroom globe, the Moon would be about this size. It's about one-fourth the diameter of the Earth. So that's how big the Moon is relative to the Earth. Uh, to show you how far away the Moon is, I'm going to have to start walking, and I have to go probably further than you might guess, uh, because the Moon is about 240,000 miles away from the Earth. This is equivalent to uh, circling the Earth 30 times. To show it to scale, I have to stand about this far away. So here's our moon, and that little circle way back there underneath the science on a sphere, that's the Earth. Because the moon is so far away and so small, um, we can't see all that much detail with the unaided eye. Uh, but using optical magnification, we can see much more detail. Even a small pair of binoculars like these ones uh, allow you to see significantly more surface detail. Uh, and you know, if we just stand kind of this close, this is somewhat equivalent to uh, what you can see with just a pair of binoculars. Uh, suddenly we can see the contours of the light and dark regions much more clearly. And we're really noticing all these circular features all over the moon. Uh, these are craters. There's a very bright one right there. Craters are formed on the moon um, from the impact of asteroids and comets, which have been striking the surface of the moon for billions of years. The surface of the moon is relatively unchanged over that time other than the formation of these craters. This is very different from the Earth. On the Earth, we have erosion and mountain building and plate tectonics, um, so craters don't last all that long on the Earth. There's craters within craters. Uh, and this is particularly true for the oldest parts of the moon, like the lunar highlands. This is where you find the most craters. Scientists can actually count the number of craters to tell how old a region of the moon is. So if we look at the lunar seas, we can see there are far fewer craters there. And that's because, you know, although the lunar highlands are about four and a half billion years old, uh, about three and a half billion years ago, lava flowed into these lower areas, into the, the, uh, the lunar seas, and erased any older craters. That's why there's fewer of them here. Right now, efforts are underway to send people back to the moon for the first time in nearly 50 years, since the end of the Apollo program in 1972. Uh, this plan involves building permanent facilities that will allow people to live and work on the moon for extended periods of time not unlike the way we can live and work right now in Earth orbit on the International Space Station. There are craters at the south pole of the moon that uh, are deep enough that they never have sunlight shining. Scientists now know that there is ice in the bottoms of those craters. Water ice. Uh, you can use water that you find on the moon uh, for drinking uh, and for irrigation for any food that you might grow on the moon. Uh, you can also use water to make breathable air and even rocket fuel. To see how we do that, uh, you can actually do an at-home activity. In order to do this activity, you're going to need um, a container to which you can add 100 milliliters of water, uh, and you're going to need to add one tablespoon of Epsom salt to that water, and then stir until it's completely dissolved. Uh, the reason we add the salt is we make the water electrically conductive. We're also going to need uh, a 9 volt battery, uh, and we're going to need two alligator clips and two washers. And we're going to connect uh, one end of our alligator clip to the battery and the other end to the washers. And we're going to put those washers uh, in the water. And I've connected one of the wires to the battery and I just need to connect the other wire to the battery. Now watch the wire of the washers very closely because the moment I uh, connect the battery, bubbles begin to form on the washers. What's happening here? Well, we're performing electrolysis. This is a chemical process where we use electricity to separate molecules into the atoms that they're made up of. And the electricity is actually separating the hydrogen from the oxygen. Um, if we were on the moon, this would be very useful to us. We could collect that oxygen and we could pipe it into the facility where we were living and we could breathe that oxygen. Or we could collect the oxygen in one tank and the hydrogen in a separate tank and we could actually use them as rocket fuel. Um, but I hope you've enjoyed this video and I hope to see you next time. Bye.